Yeah. Episode Ooh. 12 of the Tap Haven Podcast, where we are oh, on our... S- yes, number 12. Oh, I thought you just said you couldn't find number 12. No, is I could 12 or 13? No, this is 12. This 12. is 12. This I couldn't, is 12. I couldn't find 12, but I thought that we did it the last of this series okay. last week, but we didn't. We did a different whiskey last week because we're continuing today on our journey in the Flaviar Metaverse. Ooh, Flaviar Metaverse! First, 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 first. And I got in here. Right? Everything on my desk just fell. Oh, no. <laughs> but no bourbon. Oh, no. So how have y'all been this week? How's y'all's weeks going? Matt? Matt <laughs> I've been good. It's my birthday week, I, I guess, or whatever. Yeah. So it's been pretty good. I got a lot of well wishes yesterday, which was great. Um, I also, and this is uh, news for all of you, I interviewed for a position today. What? That's exciting. How Very cool. cool. Uh, Very cool. Uh, I think I crushed it. Um, yeah, you did. It is a position that is similar to what I was doing last year, except... I will not be, let's say, existing within a system that demands that I do other other stuff on top of that job. Um, so yeah, uh, that's my kind of surprise news. They the interview went, I think, pretty well, um, and I'm excited to eventually get the call for the next one because I'm pretty sure I made it, but we'll see. Um, Oh, um, I also got an espresso machine. Dude, it's so good. Oh, my God. We got even started. Oh, man, dude, started, just man. wait. The absolute <laughs> majesty that is the espresso. We got one for Christmas. So my, uh-huh. my dad got us a, a, one of the nice single Breville's. So it, we already had a really nice grinder. We didn't need a grinder. We were like, get the grinder out of here. We just want the nice... You espresso just want the bamb, you know. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And man, we've been making espresso every day. My wife, of course, has been doing it every day. I do it every now and then. Uh, but the man, it's it's so good. It's just so much mm-hmm. better than I am any other stoked. option. I went to a coffee class with my wife last week. Or the week before, sorry, the week before. And it was supposed to be like the Valentine's gift or whatever. I didn't know that she was like prepping me for this eventual reveal because apparently her and my uh, sisters and my mom participated in putting this gift together. So I'm stoked. Um, I haven't made any of it yet because it... the act of doing it alone at home intimidates me. I think for my <sighs> inaugural one, I, for my first one, I need to have an adult present. You need, as well you as need another, adult as well, supervision. As well as, myself, as well as myself. I'm admitting that I'm an adult. I just need my social anxiety over doing new things is usually solved by another adult being in the vicinity. And that other adult is usually my wife. So, Yeah. That's what I got going on. Uh, other than that, yeah, those are the events that are going on. Soon, soon, but we can talk about that later. Yes. Oh, yeah, I think I'm going to see that on two- Saturday. Very nice. Mm-hmm. So, do you remember um, uh, Hung? We played yeah. D&D with Hung. Yeah. He has the Instagram called SunLR Pours. He's mm-hmm. actually, when he's, you know, when he's not managing a martial arts studio slash teaching and when he's not woodworking he works as a barista and so he has a whole bunch of uh you know artistic um postings of of what he does with the the cappuccinos or whatever you want to call them the espressos Mm -hmm. and the milk Mm -hmm. and the steamed milk and everything like that so i'm gonna (laughs) you want some inspiration go check out his channel (laughs) <laughs> I'm not going to be this guy. I'm going to try not to, but like I I can appreciate the art form of it. I think lattes are bullshit. <laughs> oh, but steamed. So, here's the trick. Here's the trick. No. You get no, your espresso no ready. There you get some no milk. Trick. You get some uh-huh. milk. Uh-huh. And what you do is you make your own demerar syrup and you put a quarter ounce of demerar syrup into the milk before you steam it 
do you hear this man and then you steam like i'm supposed to know what that milk syrup is supposed to be demerara is the sexy sugar not the that not the white sugar that doesn't make (laughs) sense eric it's a food not a woman and or man for those who have preferences outside of that but it is not a being of sexual attraction for me I'm sorry. Sugar, when I see a bag of sugar, I don't go, mm, girl, what you doing? Oh, it's so good, though. Check, I, have to, I don't have to check that my wife isn't looking when I walk down the baking aisle, Eric. Man, okay? dude, I'm just saying it's got this nice golden no. color, and mm. it adds a little bit of molasses and caramel to your sugar oh, flavors. Yes. Man, Anthony, he's so is good. He, is he describing honey? No, 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 no. It's darker. It's darker than that. It it has more character than honey. This is this is not honey. It is Demerara sugar. It's so good. Just send me the link. Send me the link. I got you. I got you. This is why I always have my my pre drink. (laughs) 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 Because shit like this happens. Oh my god. Also, I just. I was waiting for you to say when we're supposed to add the powdered lactate. Oh, yeah. yeah. When are we oh, supposed yeah, to yeah, add yeah. The... <laughs> Because I believe all three of us are lactose now, intolerant. Oh, no. I, I, I will I drink that milk. Say, oh. I mean, I are you still lactose intolerant, though? I, I, isn't it true I, I that it, everybody's a little bit lactose intolerant? Like, after 20 or That's something? Like, I'm everybody saying. kind of yes. becomes a little Pretty bit much. intolerant to it? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm still reeling from the Vietnamese coffee that I drank yesterday. Like oh, my man. body's still going. <laughs> Sometimes you have to make the sacrifice yeah, for the bad. greater good. Man. That's true. That's Real true. quick though, like PSA, I I ordered some lactate thanks to uh, Thor from Pirate Software's little short about it. I was like, oh, I didn't even know that was a thing. Uh, I think it made me way worse than milk or dairy ever has. Oh, and wow. then I had to look that up. And on their own website, there, all the one star reviews are people saying like, "This caused me to dry heave and vomit all over the place. This caused Ooh. way worse issues than I've ever had with milk." Like, then I was like, "Huh? So, yeah, that's uh, lactate might not be the solution for you. I know that there's other solutions for people who are trying to get uh, some form of lactose in their system." Go ahead, Eric. So me and my wife do A two milk, which I do. Is... That. I like that. Very good, and I feel like it's much easier on mine and her stomachs, get, especially. But where do you get A2 cheese? That I don't know. I don't know. However, farm, you can make know. paneer with A2 milk. Ooh. Well, if you can make paneer, that paneer is cheese. What? No, hold on. Paneer hold is, on. is cheese. On. Like what paneer Anthony's is, saying is yes. that he, like, there aren't any companies. Doing uh, I need an A2 pizza right. stat. I was, I yeah, was yeah, going to yeah, say, because yeah. so, I was about to have a meltdown and be like, you are a man who is married to, a, to an Indian woman, and you just told me that I don't know where you're going to get cheese, but I know that you can make Without you can make making it yourself. Without making it yourself. Uh-huh. That's, okay, so I need that was my intent there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like nobody's selling that, you know, but it, you can make it. Okay. Right. I was going to make a text real quick and be like, you find your man. <laughs> He's saying wild shit on this podcast. You find your saying man. wild <laughs> shit. He's going off the rails. <laughs> but, um, so what are we, what are we drinking Anthony, today? No, 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 no. Anthony, what's, yeah. what have you, you been up to my guy? Oh man. The only thing I could remember was when you mentioned espresso machine, we finally got a Keurig. <laughs> oh, coffee news across the board. Yeah. yeah. We, we We've been making pour over forever because we didn't want to, you know, be wasteful. But uh, we just we gave in. We got some of those reusable pods, and then uh, and then there was a big sale, so I just bought some normal pods. But you can recycle all that stuff. You can compost it, so it's no biggie. It's no biggie. Yeah. Okay. Mr. You know that footprint. You can get some really good plant feed off of uh, coffee compost for sure. Are you actually yeah. composting? I have a compost bin showing up like tomorrow. Uh, yeah, we got a big garden. I mean, I live on a farm, so I know. There's, I know. there's a garden area where a bunch of pumpkins and squash and stuff were growing when we arrived. 
But yeah, that's actually the biggest thing is uh, it's warmed up here a little bit and everything's turning green, which means I'm running out of time because everything's ready to grow and I don't want everything to grow in certain places and I still got to clear out like a three foot perimeter around the fence so that nothing's pulling not down the fence. En- you have not so. set the rules of engagement for the war you are about to wage against your own property. Good yeah. luck, friend. Good well, luck. But luckily, my dogs think they're cows and they eat grass. So <laughs> they're already helping. They're already yeah. on, the, on that train, man. Just it's weird, man. You know, hard, man. <laughs> you know when you see like, maybe it's like a cartoon animal or or definitely just like a cowboy or something. They got like a piece of straw in their mouth or just like a big long piece of grass that they're chewing on. Mm-hmm. My littlest dog, Yui, showed up like that the other day. She ran up to me and she just had a long piece of grass sticking out of her mouth. And I was like, where'd you have your hat? <laughs> what are you doing? Say that. I was out on the bayou by there. Look like you she should be on the there. cover of Old Yeller. Oh, yeah. Freaking adorable. Uh, but yeah <laughs> how about you eric man you it, it's been a pretty good week we're getting prepped for another judo tournament so it's been lots of training and of course doing a lot of the channel stuff for tap haven getting some of that set set up for us so uh it's been pretty uneventful i i will say i'll save it for later but there's a show that me and my wife have been watching and oh yeah i, I bet It'll be it'll be a fun little talk through. Everybody here has already seen it or at least knows about it. So it'll it'll be a fun yeah. little topic. We'll discuss later in the thing. But I am both excited and scared of today's whiskey. Before we jump into it. Before we jump into it. Uh, uh, uh. Where is he going? I wanted to tell you guys about this. Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. you got, drink. you went out and you were like, I need a whiskey. And so you went and you mm-hmm. got, and of course, a few episodes ago, for anybody who didn't see it, we actually tried the base Sagamore rye. Mm-hmm. And, and so, also, Nat, we, and we really liked it. We actually enjoyed yeah, this yeah. rye a good bit. It was a good five almost across the board for everybody. And Nat for went and everyone. got the cask strength sagamore spirit rye so how was that this thing kicks like a freaking mule oh this thing is no joke so the abv is 56 sorry the alcohol content is 56 percent yep and it's 112 proof yeah that thing is not playing around once it hits hits your mouth like it is it's like i am a flavor and you are going to experience me for the next five, ten seconds, and you're gonna I'm gonna burn. It is the first time that I've actually felt the Kentucky hug and like it been a lasting hug. Kentucky hugged you real good on that one. This is hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a it, I mean like it's a rye. So I I mean like you're supposed to expect that. I was not expecting that kind of heat. It looks so, really dark too. Yeah, it it's does. It's super dark. It's super sh- it's super sweet, but it's also super strong and I'm not going to lie. I had this and I was like, "Oh, this is pretty good." And then I I tried the other thing that I um uh, about to show you guys. But uh after experiencing it, I had an immediate hangover. Like the sugar content was just like so high and I had just like not, apparently I had not eaten or something. And so my body was like, "Mm-mm." Get this out. We need to go ahead get and hydrate. Out. We need to take some medication. We need to get it out because I, I can't. I can't be doing this. So um, that was my first initial uh, experience with the cast strength Sagamore Spirit Rye, but it's fantastic. I would okay. definitely <laughs> suggest that you guys try it. Um, you sounded like a battered husband for a second there. You know, the, minute, the first like ten minutes of that description were like it's beating me up. It, I don't know if I can stand yeah. straight anymore. And then the last part is like, but I really liked it, guys. Like, this was I really, really good. <laughs> it's out, out of the two things that I got, it was my favorite. Um, I would definitely see this in like a mo- in a mule or in like any form of uh, whiskey sour or mix that you are doing. Uh, I would also take this straight, but just in moderation. This is 
This thing is flavorful, but it is not for the casual sipper. Like you're not going to take two of these and and feel like, yeah, like I'm just I'm just kind of cruising along. No, like watch out. Is, is there any sweetness at all? You said it was very sugary. It's sugary in the sense that like you do get that sweet, but it's it's only on the back end of the processing because like when I got the hangover, I was like, oh, it's the sugar content with it. Because it's so high in the, in the, in whatever sugar or fructose that was inside of the uh, mash bill for this, uh, or whatever the uh, sorry the molasses that was used for this uh, mash bill, it was too much for my body at the time. Now I'm curious how it feels now because I've actually eaten everything, so I might try it after we do our whiskey of the day. But yeah, would definitely suggest. Also. For those of you guys who are in in uh, Houston, I also sorry in in Texas, I got the Austin the Austin Still straight bourbon whiskey, and I was looking for the red corn because apparently it had won a lot of awards, and I wanted to try it out, but wasn't able to find it. So I got the straight, and I'm still on the lookout for the uh, red corn, but also very interesting flavor profile i don't know what i'm tasting while i'm drinking it so i would be very interested to see you all's experience next time one of you guys shows up i will go ahead and uh return the favor and send you guys off with some of this uh whiskey yeah. because it's very interesting it's just like i'm so baffled by it i don't oh. know what the flavor is i mean like i could obviously go and find the tasting notes but i don't want to do that here i'd rather it yeah. be something we can look into later. yeah we'll do a thing on it and then yeah well, but, but yeah, we got to work through. Babies. We got to work through these little vials so that yeah, uh, we do. We, we do. We have them available to right here. send off. Yeah. I have a. I have a bunch more too. Bunch more Whoa. vials. So Why? We're gonna. We're gonna keep going. And I just a, a little bit of teaser for sometime in the distant future. Of course, I I was able for anybody who doesn't know, Matthew Lillard actually has started his own whiskey line. And I am going to get some. And so we're going to be able to try that on the podcast. Obviously, it's going to be a while. I have to get all the whiskeys. And then, of course, I also have to distribute them out. Uh, I think Anthony may have also purchased them, but uh, we'll have to get them over I to Nat. Mm -hmm. So I definitely did not. <laughs> but look forward to that. That will be at least four of our whiskeys later this year. Mm, I got to I got to say, uh, luckily, so I sent a link to my wife and she went. So y'all, if y'all don't get that, like y'all are failing horribly. She was like, it would be like a sin for y'all wow. not to get that, right? She's trying she's like, to shame like, us. You, you have to get that. And I was like, I might already have. And I said, like, uh, <laughs> like a, a face that's like straight, straight mouth. She called it a frown. I was like, that's not a frown. She's like, why is the frown? I was like, it's uh really expensive <laughs> <laughs> they are pricey whiskeys they're also pricey for kind of what we're getting we, we don't know too mm. much about this i would love to maybe if the people share us enough like and subscribe below maybe one day we'll actually be able to get matthew lillard on this podcast i think that would be such a cool thing to talk to him about this stuff that he's doing he really is right up our alley this convergence of gaming and whiskey and D and D that we all love, and I think a lot of our audience will also love. So, Matthew Lillard, if you ever hear this, please just email us. The business emails on the YouTube. Shoot us an email. We would love to have you on the show, and hopefully, sometime in the coming years, we'll get you. <laughs> I really think this good. thing tastes good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did, you, did you read the fine print of what you purchased? Because you didn't just purchase alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. What we, else did you? We go? did not. We did not. Okay, he knows. He knows. So that's we will. We will go through the whole contract uh, when we actually try this whiskey because that's its own thing. Really fun stuff. M Matthew Lillard, I will say you you stole my idea. I talked about Ooh. this idea uh, about seven, eight months ago of doing a very similar D&D whiskey inspired idea. You beat me to the market and it's wonderful. I love what you're doing, but hopefully we can work together someday. That'd be cool. With that said, today we have one of the lightest whiskeys 
on the market, I think. Like, this thing is insanely pale. Like, yeah, I, I've never seen something so pale. Look is it at the this. number two? It is the number two. Yeah. This is the number like, two. Luckily, I think they actually used this as reference material for the identity <laughs> color yeah. in the little freaking book because I think it is exactly pale straw. I think you are entirely <laughs> correct. The pale straw color is definitely there. It might even be white wine. It could be white wine. Man. What is this? Actually, right? that is... Yeah, Matt, do you think that's white wine or pale straw? That's gotta be wine. It is. That's whiskey? It yeah, is pour it into whiskey. Y'all's, y'all's glasses to see if it changes at all. So, and it might be a more pale in the smaller uh, circumference little tote glass. I'm not even going to sniff it yet. I'm just going to pour it. Oh, That's yeah. give it, Get your pour going. This the is... crazy thing. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to start the, the spiel. So, by all means, go well, this finish is, your thought. I'm just surprised that it's so pale, but it's not low ABV. So, it's like 46%, right? And I'll go ahead and share that I went ahead and grabbed a Red Breast 12. I keep this on hand because it's Eric's favorite. So if he's ever over here, he's got that ready to go. And it's far darker Mm -hmm. than what we have today. I'll hold them side by side for those watching. And the thing is that the Red Breast 12 is actually only 40%. So it's weaker, but richer in color. And I just find that fascinating. I always associated darker with more you know like less watered down more more strength but i guess maybe that's not the case not always not always i would generally say there is some merit to that but that isn't always the case now that smells really good the smell so i will say just to kind of preface this this is an irish whiskey by the jj Corey company who only have three whiskeys in their line right now. This is the Hansen Irish whiskey. Now, each of these Irish whiskeys kind of do a different thing, have a different idea. The Hansen is an Irish whiskey that is matured in bourbon and American craft whiskey casks. They're sourced from Kentucky, Tennessee, and New York. The Hansen is a blend of, I believe... 10-year-old single-grain Irish whiskeys and 4-year-old single-grain Irish whiskeys. About an 80-20 split from the sources I was able to find. However, their actual statement on their site is different than the sources I was able to find. They essentially say it's a blend of 4- to 11-year-old Irish whiskeys that were aged in these American oak ass. Yeah, I would say if they're... Is a good deal of eleven-year-old whiskey in here. That ten-year-old whiskeys. That is actually a pretty good age. That's about where I like the Irish whiskey to to start at. And I would say that's probably why you're seeing this lighter color is because it wasn't aged for as long as the red breast. Twelve year. Mm. Oh right, because age is really where color comes from, isn't it? Yeah. It's pulling Help. that from Wait. the barrels. Wait, so they come from four year to eleven year barrels. No, There's no, no. four four barrels between four and eleven. So right? no, there is a blend of mm. some Irish whiskeys between ages right. four and eleven. Four. We don't four. know how many were blended together. It could be any number. Right. There is one source that I found who looked into this whiskey and he said that the bottle that he had was specifically 80% of a 10 year old single grain Irish whiskey and 20% of a four year old single grain Irish whiskey. So question. Yeah. If that's the case and they're saying that the pet, the heritage, I guess the pedigree of this is between four to 11 years depending on your um, blend. Uh, Does that, wouldn't the aging of that current whiskey color this already? Or is... 10 years isn't a lot of time in 
bourbon barrel, years. especially okay. in whiskey if, years. Yeah, in whiskey years. But also, you have to remember, this is an Irish whiskey that is matured in these bourbon and American whiskey barrels. That doesn't mean that it's going to be in them for long. Mm. They could be in there for any amount of time. And those barrels were already used for another whiskey, which means that it might not have a lot of color left to give to this Fair. whiskey. Got it. Now, mm. right off the nose, there's something about Irish whiskey that, and this is our, is this our first Irish whiskey of the podcast? No, Sagamore is Irish, isn't it? The Sagamore is an Irish rye, right? Yeah, it's an Irish rye. rye uh, oh, so yeah, this was our first whiskey then. Yeah, this is yeah. our first traditional Irish whiskey. And right off the nose, there's something super cool about Irish whiskeys. It's sweet. Very sweet. Definitely cakey, like it says in the pamphlet. I think maybe some cinnamon. I'm getting like kind of mealy, like almost similar to the red breast and how it's almost like a like a uh, like a a dry cookie. So Irish whiskeys across the board always tend to bring out notes of shortbread cookies Mm -hmm. and baking and buttery like baking spices and butter almost Mm -hmm. and it tends to have this baking like sweet baking aspect to it profile it is just very traditional of an irish whiskey now because this is a single grain whiskey i'm assuming that it's probably malted barley although i haven't been able to find what grain they were using but most likely, this was a 100% malted barley, which was double or triple distilled. Triple distilling is more common in Ireland than double st- distilling, so it's more likely that that's the case. And usually, these things tend to contribute. Oh. Don't get too close. To that flavor. So and sorry, I just snorted some chocolate on accident. Oh, no. Oh, buddy. There's poop of chocolate everywhere. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, s- and so these things are going to contribute to that buttery shortbread flavor profile that we're getting. And I love Irish whiskeys. They're, they're my favorite genre of whiskey. They're probably the only whiskey that you will smell or taste and you'll get shortbread. But... Fair. I've had a lot of really good Irish whiskeys, and I've had a lot of really bad Irish whiskeys, just like any other whiskey on the market. So I am excited to try it. The nose is good. The nose is fantastic. The, th- the weird thing is, though, for me, that Eric is constant, not constantly, Eric has told me about this shortbread stuff with the red breast a few times, and I have never smelled anything sweet about red breast. But with this, I immediately pick up on it. Oh, I don't know what that's about. Hmm. And the red breast is even going to be sweeter than this because, of course, the reason they call it a red breast is because they're aged in wine casks. I can see that. So the red breast 12 Mm -hmm. is aged in, I believe, uh, port, the port wine. It sounds, it's probably port. Let's see. From what I remember you telling me. It is a rich mix of dried fruit and spice with toasted oak and sherry undertones. Triple sherry. Oh, oh, sherry casks. Oak casks. That's right. The, the Red Breast 27, I believe, it is, is a ruby port cask. Mm. Yeah. Instead of the sherry cask. Which is a little bit different. But the, uh, the sherry cask is going to give it a little bit more of a sweeter profile than a normal Irish whiskey. This is the smoothest whiskey I've ever had. This whiskey is smooth. And uh, what I, 
smooth in the not smooth not in the sense that like it gives you a flavor and then it like eases out it's that it's almost as if it didn't exist and then like you're like oh no like i i definitely got flavor i definitely got pieces of something mm. but it it is there and it is nice and gentle it doesn't punch you in the face it isn't like, very sweet this is not a sweet whiskey on the mouth in my opinion it almost has a butter it really takes the butter aspect of the unmalted barley and epitomizes that it tastes like butter up front and then right after that it gets a little spicy it gets a little peppery but not harsh just it kind of tingle like a tingly black pepper spice type of deal maybe even yeah, baking spices I can get baking spices. I don't get the butter. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about with that either. I don't get the butter. That's only the spices. Pepper. I get the spices. And like before that, I there's like a... So, there's an undefined flavor. I don't feel like... It is when, baked. It is baked. I'll say that. Ooh, and the, that second go-through when I really chewed it, at the end, I got sour, almost like a sourdough bread. At the end, sourdough. Interesting. Hold on. What's really annoying for me is that the uh, fantastic smell is gone. Oh yeah. So it's like really nice and sweet, but now I I only smell acetone. So I don't get acetone on the smell, but I do get bread now, and the sweetness also dissipated a lot for me too. And I I I feel like I'm smelling a. Uh, spiced bread almost but i will say when i have this in my mouth and i'm kentucky chewing it like i'm chewing it around a little bit mm -hmm. when it's just i'm chewing it tastes like i'm chewing butter it's viscous a little bit it's thick almost syrupy to a certain degree and i i feel like i'm just getting butter on that front side I'm not getting butter. Mm. Okay, I, th I think after chewing on it for a, a long time, it turned into butter. <laughs> <laughs> you turned but it only up. like only in like a a feeling way, like in a texture way, not in like a flavor way for me. I will say it's super subtle up front. Like it's even if you don't mm -hmm. taste butter up front, I would argue the minute you put it in your mouth, it's very subtle. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, I'm now sold on this sourdough type of bread type of flavor. My mind's kind of stuck on that now for that tail end. Mm. I would, I think, I would lean more towards your assumption of the of the uh, bread versus their tasting note of cake. I do not get cake from Oh, this. yeah. Whoever was writing their tasting notes was tripping balls. <laughs> um, you can list off what they said that they had their, uh, their tasting notes on. Dear audience, mm -hmm. Flaviar has decided to say that so, this tastes like cake, well, vanilla. Before, <laughs> before you dig yourselves into a hole, I believe this isn't just taste, but smell. So I, when I smelt it, I smelled the cake. Agreed, agreed. It was much sweeter for those first few sniffs. And I, 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 I smell it still. I would say that some of this. Oh, you know what? I kind of get. But okay. they definitely have cake, vanilla, peach, oak, fruit, cereal, tannic, dry, cereal. and slightly sweet. And I think there is. Something to be said about there being a little bit of an oak flavor. I think that, mm. in my mind, is what I'm perceiving of the sourness of that sourdough bread flavor at the tail end that I'm experiencing. Additionally, I think that's also causing some of those tannic uh, flavors and that dry flavor are all things that I attribute to sourdough bread in my mind. And I think that that those are getting wrapped up into sourdough bread at the end of this tasting experience for me. But they definitely have this sweetness 
this vanilla cake, slightly sweet notes, which I think, like Anthony said, those are really just exist on the nose to some degree and not so much in the flavor. But the Definitely one the thing flavor. that I am not getting at all from this tasting or smelling experience is the fruit. I don't get any of that fruit. You're yeah. absolutely right. I, I, like, I don't know. Peach. Now, obviously, the person who made this tasting chart is probably a sommelier or something like that. A sommelier. There you go. But it almost sounded like you said smellier. Yeah. <laughs> That's where my <laughs> mind went, to be fair. Got, I was like, let's smellier. They got one of them smelliers over they there. They can smellier better than me. Oh, wow. But they're, they're picking up fruit. And I don't even know where I would begin to place the fruit in what I'm experiencing. The only time I could have said anything about fruit was when smelling it without w before the smell went away. But even then I get and more like barely, vanilla. Wait, yeah. wait, wait, yeah. wait, 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 wait. So go back to it. I want you to think banana and sniff the glass. Don't don't drink it. It's not in the taste. We already know that. But go back to the glass and smell the actual liquor and and from a far pull not like not close up but because i'm catching it now that i'm like kind of uh thinking about it i i don't know if i get that i catch a little bit of it i see where they're going with the fruit but it, it is like you have to be you, you cannot catch any acetone with it you can't catch any of the other scents like the of the like the deeper spices or anything f from the alcohol you have to just it has to be so far from the it has to be see see dude that took so long but i finally finally got it yeah there is banana holy crap because i saw the image on the now I, and I was like where's the banana like why do you have a banana as a smiley face like i don't even know what the yeah. other fruits are i'm guessing like, that's um, like maybe peach like, well they have peach on here too it's, it's definitely like a banana that's uh browned a bit like it's not yeah it's not like a straight not green no. it's not green you know not what i could see maybe how my brain is interpreting this buttery bread as banana bread as it could <laughs> it could smell similarly to banana bread mm -hmm. but i'm hmm. not getting the funkiness or banana notes that you may get in a rum for example true true right yeah like when you're when you have a good pronounced. rum there mm -hmm. are banana notes there that are very pronounced that is not here so when they say banana mm -hmm. it gets funky guys what you, yeah go for it guys Okay, I was sniffing it so much that I was like out of breath and I was going for the for another drink, another sip there. And I had to take in a, a good long whiff while taking it in and bam, cake, like really strong. It was just like all the sweetness of cake came back while I was sniffing and and pouring it down my gullet. That's weird. Mm. The sweetness is coming back. I like it. I will say the nose has a lot of depth to it for sure. There is definitely, in my opinion, butter, shortbread, baking. And, and sometimes you get this vanilla sweetness that creeps into the smell and it kind of goes in and out for me throughout the smelling experience. That whiskey needs to stay in your mouth for, for a while for it to fully like bloom. That is not something that you can shoot at all. Like it can't just stay in your mouth for like a good like two or three seconds, like through a wash, and then you take it. You really have to kind of sit with that. That's a that's yeah. a great thing that you just brought up there. How do you explain to people? Because so many times I'm teaching someone to chew, mm -hmm. and then they they do it for like a second, maybe less, and I'm like, you didn't mm. chew it. So there no, are. Yeah, it, you got to chew for a bit. So the other thing is you want to actually incorporate oxygen and air into your chewing. I yeah, sometimes oh, agreed, agreed. Mm -hmm. But you 
sometimes want to let air in to your mouth while you're chewing to let it aerate and oxygenate this the whiskey as well because that's going to bring out different flavors gentlemen yeah that was an interesting one yeah i definitely I, i can't say that i'm a fan of irish whiskeys because of it but Fair. It is definitely a, a defined flavor. Yeah. Yeah. So, Anthony, what would you pay for a bottle of this? That's a great question. I'm thinking, okay, with all that experience, considering the rating that I'm currently writing down, hmm. Wait, wait, really wait, sure much- wait, before that, do you like it better or worse than the Red Breast 12 you have sitting in front of you? Well, that's the funny thing. It is definitely better than the Red Breast 12. Ooh. Mm. Like, from the get go. And I've compared it several times. Interesting. And, I mean, part of that might just be like, for all we know, there's a little bit of hops in the Red Breast 12 or something else. Because. I was talking with my father-in-law about this, I think, just last night. We're quite certain that I'm allergic to hops. That's why I can't enjoy beer. Mm. And it's also why I have a hard time with certain alcohols like scotch, where because of those hops, there's just an overpowering bitter taste for me, and I don't get to pick up on much else. And that's what happens with the red breast. I'm just like, Smells okay. Tastes okay. I don't know why Eric likes it so much. I don't understand. (laughs) It does make me want to go ahead and wash the uh, mouth, the um, red breasts for a very long time to see what I get from there, too. But go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so I I, the number I was going to throw out is actually pretty in line, I think. Um, I think I would spend like 75 bucks on this. Uh, Red breast 12 looks like it goes for about 60. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's just a lot going on. It smells great. And then I thought the smell was gone. So I was like, oh, maybe it's not as good as I thought. But then the more we played with it, mm-hmm. it actually came back. And that's just, that's really neat. And so it's a, it's a fun bottle. I mean, I could, I maybe consider paying more for it. I'm, I'm not really sure about the, you know, the story behind it. I know Eric said some stuff in the beginning, but <laughs> my brain's really bad about keeping up with that so i have to go and rewatch the podcast to learn anything <laughs> but uh yeah i would i would pay at least 75 for this one um if it was more i would probably still try to acquire it just to hold on to it because if anyone came over that would that's a fun one to try to like walk them through what we just went through where it's like oh man it smells good oh the taste is okay or not bad but like it tastes normal oh the smell's gone oh wait try this smell might come back think about bananas but don't think about it too hard think about it just hard enough and it might happen oh my god so what's your rating 25 bucks go for my rating because i think if i remember right i gave red breast like a four and a half um my rating we haven't done red breast no this is just me like talking to my wife or eric when we're hanging out or something like that um what i've been i'm joking joking. go ahead go ahead i I would give it a six six out of ten okay i really it surprised me because of the i mean there's it's not doing anything wrong on the on the flavor on the taste. It's there's nothing bad there. It's just like a nice experience. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe I'm being too generous. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being nice today. You are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just like when I compare it to the red breast, I'm like, it's a lot better than that. So, come. Oh. Ah. Maybe I should knock it down to a five, but we'll see. So not. Yeah. What would you pay? I'd pay probably 60 bucks for this. Huh? Um, if it was more, 
again, like Anthony said, I would buy it because I feel like this is definitely a party drinker. Like if you sorry, not a party drinker, but like a sit down and like kind of bro session hangout. Like if you are if you play an instrument or anything or if you do some form of um, fine art and you are within a community and you're looking to go ahead and have like a like a general mixer drink to go along with you sitting and kind of taking in the uh sights and or the sounds um i have a co-worker who actually invests a lot of money into their sound system and i was like if you spend a lot of time in front of some speakers that's a lot of time just being still and just listening to music you might want to do something else along with it to kind of accent it but anybody who's in that kind of experience where you're taking in something and you want to go ahead and add a little bit of diversion where you can kind of delve into something new that's going to take a little bit of your focus to kind of broaden your horizons, I would definitely get this. Nice. For sure. And what would you rate it? I'm going to give this a 4.5. I'm not an Irish whiskey person. I know this. Uh, I knew this whenever I got the red breast and I tasted it. And I was like, oh, yeah, I, I know that flavor palette, and though it is it is interesting, it is not my cup of tea. Not your I cup of tea. Okay. I know, I come from a history of drinking rum and, uh, well, exclusively almost rum and mezcal. So anything that does not delve into those kind of uh, deeper fruity flavors, as well as kind of a effect of uh, molasses finish to it, I'm not exactly bonded to it for this to me gave me a little bit too much of a reminder that this is a this is alcohol i like to be able to taste uh the bourbon and be able to say this is actually like more so an experience than anything and this is still an experience but there's enough of there's enough of a character of like a challenge in this that makes me be like oh, okay I have to take myself out of the moment a little bit to like enjoy this I know it's supposed to be like a flavor that I'm looking for but I'm having to like talk to myself to be like okay I know this hurts but <laughs> but go ahead and process this because it's good so it hurts it hurt me but I liked it so I'll I'll start. With the price, this is MSRP'd at sixty dollars. Hell yes! Yeah. So y'all pretty much nailed That's it on the money deal. this time. Yeah. It's a good deal. I think for sixty dollars, this is a very nice Irish whiskey. Mm -hmm. I think, outside of a few notes, and here's here's kind of the kicker that will paint the picture. That will begin my rating. Mm. Sourdough is my least favorite bread. Oh, your least favorite bread. Hold on. Before we Whoa, go further. Do you even like further, bread? Hold on. 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 Hold, hold on. on. <laughs> have, you, have you ever had a grilled cheese sandwich? Yes. And I've had it okay. on Seattle sourdough, which is the only sourdough. Oh, hold on. Or not Cali, San Francisco, do you, have, do you have something that you want to say about grilled cheese, Chicago? Anthony? Oh, I yeah. Do you he doesn't say? like, he's I not can't. a cheese guy, man. I like cheese. I don't like cheddar or American or any of the, like, stinky ones. Basically, any of the stinky no ones. Cheese. You, sir, yeah. do I yeah. look, do I look like a plebeian? Do you do I look like I put anything other than artisanal cheeses artisanal. on my grilled cheese? I mean, I would love to try it because I am open minded and I want to like a bit more cheeses. Eric, should I tell the the reason behind why I can't do certain cheeses? I mean, do you remember it. You you have to now. You have to tell the story. You can't I bring it up and then not tell the people. Make it quick. <laughs> okay. I mean, long story short, yeah, there isn't really a long version of it. I'm a child, maybe five or six or seven. Uh -huh. We're at Taco Bell. I'm like, I'm full. My dad says, finish your nachos. I Dude. finished the nachos, and then he got to see him again. Oof. <laughs> so it was, Ooh. it 
forever scarred my experience with that type of cheese but i'll still eat you know mozzarella sticks and pizza and if it's blended in right and i and it's not the major smell or flavor those types of cheeses can sneak in and i'm okay with it but like i'm talking so weird. anthony i'm talking like real mozzarella that's shaved off of like a, a ball mold of it because it's been yeah. tied into a knot i'm talking like pepper jack and gruyere cheese that's added to the mix as you yeah said. i used to add pepper jack and three pepper colby jack to my sandwiches and stuff i'll still so eat stuff like that there's I just can't do grilled whole cheese new American. world my guy you put mayo on the outside of the bread and then fry it in butter and you do low and slow for at least five to t- five to seven minutes on each side and you're looking at an incredible experience not to mention the fact that you can probably store by a nice tomato soup to microwave to go along with it my guy so Dude. do you have- i'm gonna tell the trick for the audience whatever is your favorite cheese it doesn't matter what it is mm-hmm. whatever your favorite cheese is you go get that cheese mm-hmm. get a few different ones find some contrasting flavors for your grilled cheese mm-hmm. And then don't do there's some things that you don't do. There are, there are. But but go ahead. The experiment, sorry. find what yeah, works, mm-hmm, find what mm-hmm. doesn't, find your favorite cheeses. Mm-hmm. Buy some sodium citrate. Now, for anybody that doesn't know, sodium citrate <laughs> is the thing that makes cheese gooey and stringy. Oh. And oh. it's what makes it so that it, when it melts, it doesn't turn into plastic as it gets cooler. And so it doesn't get plasticky. It will stay gooey. And, <laughs> and that will allow you to expand your cheese horizon for grilled cheeses. Because most people, you have to do American cheese because American cheese is crappy cheese with sodium citrate. You can use (laughs) any cheese you want to make gooey good cheese. You just have to mix in some sodium citrate. I I feel like we could really delve into this topic, and I know we delineated from your original review of this entire whiskey experience. So let's go ahead and bring Um, it back before I start preaching about the fact that if you use real cheese, it doesn't matter whether it's stringy or not. I'm going to stop. Continue, sir. I think that there are a lot of things that are really nice about this whiskey. I personally love the buttery, smooth, viscous, upfront flavor. It just has a nice mouthfeel and is just pleasant for that first part. I think the tail part of it is not for me, and I would love to have a little bit more heat and a little mm-hmm. bit more diverse flavors throughout the experience. But the nose on this is fantastic when it comes in and you get some of those sweeter notes. Mm-hmm. I think the sourdough-esque flavors that I'm getting at the end are not for me, which is the only reason that I think I'd give this whiskey Irish whiskey a four for my mm-hmm. rating. I think it's right below something like a red breast for me. I love the red breast 12. I like a lot of the flavors there. I think the little bit of sherry and wine notes and cognac flavors that you get from that are just really pleasant and add some diversity. I also think the red breast 12 has a little bit more heat and wood notes to it that I like tend to like better. But I also could see how somebody would like this more than the Redbreast 12. And I definitely think they're on comparable levels. It's really just a matter of preference at that point of which flavors speak to you more. So I think for me, it's a four. But I think if you like these flavors, you would flip flop them and put like the Redbreast 12 at a four and this at a five. And I think that that would be where my mind would go. But definitely, this is worth a try. I love the idea that the um, JJ, Corey, JJ Corey, who is the company that is doing this, is doing. They have two other whiskeys that also sound pretty interesting. So they have the Banner County Blend and the Gale. Mm. 
uh, like Gaelic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Both of them have different things. So the the banner county blend is a blend of malt and grain Irish whiskeys instead of just single grain whiskeys like this one. That one is supposed to be a little bit more citrusy. It's an age profile of four to seven years. I'm not terribly like excited about that one, but if you like mm -hmm. citrus notes, that might be fun. However, the Gale is the perfect marriage of Irish whiskey flavors, and it's matured in sherry and bourbon casks. So essentially this one, with some of the things that I like from the red breast from being aged in sherry casks, and it's a blend of their oldest whiskeys instead so this is five to 30 years what's the msrp on that only 15 euros more so we're looking at uh 85 euros for that which i think converts to right under a hundred dollars still that's not bad for an experience not, elevated from this one not yeah. bad at all i can guarantee you we should probably go buy a bottle of that and do that in the episode. Yeah. that yeah, one yeah, sounds yeah. super exciting to me yeah. And it might just be a step up from like the Red Breast 12 and this one, which in my mind, if they deliver on that, that's like a seven out of 10 whiskey. And they mm -hmm. already have some clout with me for doing a really good general Irish whiskey. So I am actually yeah. extremely excited to try that whiskey. I think this is a very exciting first Irish whiskey for anybody. There are no affronting flavors. There is nothing inherently bad about it. And it's kind of just a nice experience overall. I think mm -hmm. the only thing is 90% of people that I've talked to love sourdough bread. And I think yeah. that's going to make you like this whiskey better than I will. So Eric, I'm going to tell you right now, I love sourdough bread as yeah. I've cited with my entire grilled cheese rant. Yep. Yeah. It didn't affect my my review. If I if if it was truly something that was like kind of defining for this taste, and I'm saying this more so for the listeners rather than for myself. Yeah. But if you are truly looking for something that's going to be evocative of a sourdough, understand that Eric's perspective of flavor is a little bit more refined. So he's picking up on individual notes that most of us don't really pick up on. I'm saying this as a non-super taster. So take that with a grain of salt. Know that the sourdough may be prevalent for you, may not be. Um, don't let it really define whether or not you're going to go to go to pick this up or not. But it is definitely a, yeah. a one to watch. Definitely, because like for me, I'll go out of my way to get sourdough bread. I love sourdough bread. This is my favorite bread. And I didn't taste any sourdough whatsoever. I wish I did. That would be cool. Yeah. Uh, and then another thing that surprised me was Eric was saying that the Red Breast 12 is hotter than what we just tasted. Uh, I'm tasting them side by side. And for me, the JJ is hotter than the Red Breast. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes sense because, I mean, it's also stronger. So it should be hotter. Right. Um, um, I I feel like this one didn't have... The Red Breast 12 always gives me like a warmer, like spicier finish and even more a little bit up front. I feel like this one is so butter forward that it just distills all of that heat out for me. Like I didn't get any acetone or hot flavors off of this whiskey almost at all for me. Hmm. Agree to disagree. <laughs> but I will yeah. say, oh, and uh, on on my last little sip, I actually tasted a lot of sweetness all of a sudden. Same. Oh, as you get to that bottom and you let it sit for a second, all of that alcohol dissipates and evaporates. The cup smells amazing after the fact. It smells Absolutely. like. Just shortbread cookies, as sweet as can be for me. And if anyone's watching, that reaction I just had was to smelling an empty uh, glass of the red breast, which to me just does not smell good. 
it still it still got a weird oh, off man. thing to it. But the JJ is is pretty great. Oh man, I love, finally get I love the Red Breast 12. Now I will say mm. that the Red Breast 12 is nothing compared to the Red Breast 12 cast strength or the 15, 21, or 27 of the Red Breast line, which are all yeah. much, much y'all, better. Y'all be careful of these cast strengths. He keeps on saying cast strength like it's going to be no joke. I'm telling you. Yeah, build up to him. Build up it'll to get him. You, it'll get you drunk. <laughs> Careful. So, Nat, tell Careful. tell Careful. the tell the audience uh, how you spent way too many hours in Hell Divers too, and how's your experience? Hey, going? man. <laughs> hey, man. Say, sir. <laughs> Excuse me. Sounds like you're not a fan of freedom. <laughs> yeah, I may or may not have spent a lot of time playing a lot of Hell Divers too in preparation right. for this. Go ahead. Do I, sense, do I sense an automaton spy in our midst? Look here, sir. Look, Eric. Here. Look here. And <laughs> that are both automaton spies. Look, man. Look, man. Sometimes you just need those cybernetics to just make it through the day. Okay. Sometimes <laughs> you just realize that hey, that missing ain't that missing arm ain't gonna grab my remote f- by itself. I'm gonna have to go ahead and install something in it. Anyway, RP aside. Um. I've been playing Helldivers 2 for the past five days, pretty much straight. Like I've, I've loaded it up every single day. And for anybody who is looking at the game from the outside in and possibly having any form of second opinions like sorry but not second guessing that would be a better uh question if you have any second guessings about this game just try it try it at least one time this has been the most fun that i have had in a video game with a social aspect bar none for the past probably two or three years like the the closest thing that I ever had was Destiny, and that was whenever I was raiding and doing hardcore uh, level of stuff where I was trying to go at, like we were trying to get uh, route, trying to do the race for first, and this was back in Destiny one day, so like it wasn't like anything serious um, like now because it's crazy now, but um. This is all fast forwarding to now. I've struggled with finding a game that would engage me in a social aspect where I would actually want to talk with the people who are playing. I've never entered into a lobby in Fortnite and unmuted my microphone ever. Ever. Because no. I just don't want to. Like, there's there's nothing about the game that makes me feel as if I want to engage with this community. And I don't know what it is about this Starship Troopers clone wannabe fuck off, but Jesus, it gets me, dude. It just does. I'm about to get to the point where I can walk around with a rail cannon. I'm so, like, I'm excited in real life. Like, I'm at work thinking, man, I can't wait to be able to just warm that sucker up and punch a hole through this bot that's been charging at me for the past, like, five days. And the only thing that I can do is run away. I want to punch this thing in the face so hard with the fist of justice. That's where I'm at. And if that makes me slightly addicted to a to a style of gaming, then so be it. But... I will say this for those who may be running into a situation where you don't have a game that really pulls at that social aspect. Maybe you've been looking for it. Helldivers is it, man. There are some there are some chuckle idiot people on here, and it's okay. Sometimes they blow you up and you're just like, hey man, maybe don't throw out all those stratagems at one time, okay? Maybe maybe one time just let me throw out something and we should be okay, right? I love the game. It's really good. Um, 
I have rose tinted glasses because I played the first one and it was the first experience I really had with my with another circle of friends that I have that um, it was a full squad. There's four of us and we played the first one and it was fun. It was just like couch co-op fun where everybody like kind of came around. We all sat down on one at one couch and played it together. And then eventually we started living in separate places. So we played it to get uh, played it apart. This I want them to pick this game up so bad because I just want to like have the adult version of what we have done before. And I know it's going to be enjoyable, but I don't need it because the game itself has evolved to the point where I can play this with anybody as long as it's just like a significant other that I have and I'll have a blast. It's so good. It's so good, guys. I don't care what anybody says about this game. I don't care what they say about optimization. I don't care what they say about graphics. I don't care what they say about um, any form of buggy um, code. This game fucking slaps, dude. Anyway, that's what I'm saying. One, seven of my last nine shorts have been this game with these two guys. So if y'all want to see them going a little crazy with me, check it out. And two, how do you feel about people using single press buttons macros to do their stratagems look if you wanted to be a bitch just go ahead and <laughs> not play the game it's all <laughs> about the codes man i don't care Wait. if you have any macros because then you get to certain planets where they mix those up oh good and if you send them in you get different stuff so i'm like okay yeah go ahead play stupid see what happens Good. Yeah, I, I, maybe, I guess they thought about that. Man, I feel like this game... There are a few games that have come out over the course of years that simply master fun. Yeah. And their goal is fun. And if you are trying to do something as silly as create macros to make the game simpler... In that quote regard, unquote, quote unquote, by the way, because go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. But I want to speak to that afterward. Let me explain a situation from Helldivers mm-hmm. 2 that could occur. Mm-hmm. You're in a squad of two. The friend gets mercilessly killed by bugs and ripped apart and flo- th- gets thrown 50 feet in the opposite direction. You're like, <laughs> shit, I got to save him. And then you go and you start entering in the stratagem to try and resurrect him. And you're just a second too slow before a grenade pops off and throws you off with him. (laughs) That is just fun. It's just funny, man. (laughs) It's just hilarious. And if your goal is to take that out of the game by creating a macro, you're missing the point of the Mm -hmm. game. Absolutely. In my opinion. And look, this is not to say that you shouldn't play that way or you can't min-max or they can't be enjoyable to like do the best you can. But I, you can min-max. I think you're missing the goal of the mm-hmm. game. And I don't think you're embracing the parts of it that just make silly, fun situations. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if you're playing it just to get to the end, you're just missing a lot of the fun parts, which is unfortunate, I feel, for some people. And I, I feel like the game has no actual end. It just yeah. continues to reveal the layers of what the experience is supposed to be. And I feel like that is an extremely special circumstance for the gaming uh, environment that we find ourselves in now. There are a multitude of games that are like, this is it. You load in, this is the game. Apex Legends is a great example. You load in, this is the game. These are your powers. This is what you can do within that space. And everything is based on you, upon your skill. And there's no knock on that. There are some people who are incredible at that. There are some people who are incredible at Rainbow Siege. I've started watching Shroud like start playing in the game with uh, Jinxie. And it is unreal the skill that some people have for those games so 
no knock against them. But when you come to this game, it is literally unadulterated fun that is based on the onion concept of you start at the center and you slowly reveal that the world is just continuing to grow on uh, absorbent levels of, oh, we can just do that. Sick. Okay. And the game continues to throw things at you in challenging ways. Yep. Example. I just recently unlocked the challenging difficulty and I've, I, I'm not treading past into suicidal and hell diver or hell dive because I don't talk to every, like everybody on the comms is not talking and you have to be talking at that difficulty or else things go sideways real fast. Um, but being at, at that level, I have run into a lot of situations where I'm like, oh, what am I supposed to do when the world drops three fuck three tanks on me? What am I supposed to do? Like, where am I supposed to go? Like, there's no there's no safe place. One of them spawned behind you. Two of them are in the front of you. What do you do? And the sheer chaos is the actual fun part of the game. And it only gets more intensified whenever you get these power ups. I'm going to say the railgun again because it is my beloved. I've experienced it by taking it from people's dead bodies. And I I have every single time it has happened, I have spent the entire level playing like an absolute sweaty try hard because I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to drop this thing. I love it so much. <laughs> it is the Demerara sugar. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Oh, my God. Oh. So. Again, if there's anybody who is looking for a game to play that is going to satisfy their social and uh, in, uh, serotonin level enjoyment, this game does it. If you like big explosions, if, you wa- if you've d- watched any form of sci-fi movie that's a little corny, you're going to love this. Um, yeah. I, I, mean, you I, kinda... give 10, I give it a 10 out of 10. You you kind of have to watch Starship Troopers before playing this. So my my wife hadn't seen it, so I made sure she did. I watched it after, man. Hell yeah! You gotta watch it before. No, it's, it's no, amazing. no, because I, I feel like this is the perfect entry level for somebody who may have been playing video games. Like, let's say that somebody plays like from software style games, and like this is their first foray into like a difficulty difficulty scaling game that ventures into the dumminess of um starship troopers and mindsets like that i feel like this is the perfect entry for that i feel like if you're playing this game you're like wow this is really dope and somebody says you know there's a movie like that basically does this like it is literally the the uh the blueprint that they satired this and they uh generated this entire game based on and yeah, I, w- I would honestly say you could probably watch Star Wars Starship Troopers either before or after this and still get a lot of enjoyment for it. Like, there's some people who are taking the I- the fascist level of, of propaganda and uh, freedom uh, spouting from this game and, st- and taking it for serious. And I'm like, guys, it's satire. The entire game is satire. Yeah. It's okay. Unclutch your bungholes. It's going to be all right. I'm telling you right now, the, the, the developers know what they are doing. And it's only going to become more apparent whenever they really feel more about the game. Because I'm telling you right now, if you think it's just insectoids and automatons, you've got another thing coming. You remind of- me there's a time that we were on a uh, camp. We're camping. It was kind of like a company thing, but not really... Um, it was just a bunch of people that I worked with. We were all out camping, and some of us had friends or or significant others there. And I don't remember the topic of discussion, but I made a, a joke, just like this video game does, you know? Mm-hmm. A, a, a very much joke. And this person flips out and goes, calls me like a, uh, what, what do you call the person that thinks we should get the right genes and the right people or something like that. Like all kids Aryan. should have no, not Aryan. It's like a Nazi. No, no. It's just like, I, I think that's, I can't remember the word, but they called me that. And I was like, what? And they're like, yelling at me. No, no. It's, um, 
You you na you you utilitarian? You, no, you're. It's just someone that like wants to breed the right people or something like that, hmm. or like get the right Unigenist. genes. Genist? Unit? 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 Eugenist? Uh, Eugenist? 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 That might be unit- correct. <laughs> <Are you Dennis? laughs> it, was, it was so weird because they were having like they were like attacking me and I was like I was trying to be funny uh, and I was funny but <laughs> you're the only one that didn't laugh you're and and, and then uh, it was just weird and then a bee showed up and they had like a panic attack and I felt really bad for them because they were like very they were very unstable it was really sad it just made me sad I was just like wow this person's like Really I used to think this lot. person was eugenicist. Yeah. Eugenicist. Yes, yeah. that's. I right. knew it was something like that. It was like eugenics yeah. is the study of. Uh, yeah. singular... Eugenics is the no 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 not a study. Important. It is oh. a set of beliefs and practices oh. that aim to improve the genetic quality of a human population. Not a fucking science, y'all. Get that shit out your head. <laughs> yes. Yes, at least not by definition. Obviously, there might be Mm -hmm. scientists that study eugenics now Mm -hmm. where their goal is to, they don't have a belief or practice for that. They just have this scientific study behind how do you make the genetic quality of the human race better? That obviously might also be true, but Mm -hmm. eugenics in and of itself is a set of beliefs and practices. Got it. Uh, but that's crazy. As as that one of weird. as one of my good friends who I play board games with, he he was playing board games one time with this guy who I don't know, and he always used to say, "Stop having fun and play the game." <laughs> and I feel like some people gotta have fun. Don't worry about it so much. <laughs> some people have to have fun yeah some people just need to have it man it's yep. okay yeah back to the uh the stratagems where you have to enter you know the keys for stuff yeah man i i really just wish that more games would implement that like when you watch uh animes like sword art online and they're trying to cast a spell and it looks like they're actually having to figure something out to cast that spell it's not just mm-hmm. oh i pushed a button and it happened I wish that when you're playing like World of Warcraft, if you want to cast a spell, enter the thing. If you're even if you're a warrior, normally you're just fighting, okay, just like shooting your gun, whatever. But oh, you want to cast rage? Okay, you better find the right moment and enter it really fast, and boom, you got it, or you didn't. I you know, like, think I think you're right. I think that there is an opportunity to have that happen, but I feel like the era of quick time events so mm-hmm. put a stopper on a lot of that being included in into games i don't entirely know if that's what caused it i think it's more that interesting systems take development time and oftentimes what i see is when a game begins its development They focus on a core mechanic. They focus on a core idea. And then they add in features, essentially. The only features that get added are ones that make money. Yeah. And so AAA titles, for example, they get one really good core mechanic. And then everything that's added on top of that are money-making mechanics. Now, you obviously have some edge cases or they'll add like one or two mechanics. But, and Anthony knows I'm a huge advocate for this because I've posited game ideas that I would love to execute one day, where every class has a different play style that is interesting and fun, but plays entirely differently. And so this is this idea of like one class maybe playing a pseudo rhythm type of game. Mm -hmm. Another class may be playing a pseudo memorization style of game and a different class may be playing some sort of crisis management RTS style of game. 
just to kind of execute what they normally do. And as long as what doing. exactly, and as long as that's engaging, fun in each of its rights, people will naturally be like, "Oh, today I feel like playing a, more of a rhythm style of game, so I'm going to do that class." And as long as you make class changing and stuff like that intuitive, easy, low barrier to entry, so that you can change those experiences often enough, mm-hmm. people really won't mind that. Oh, I don't like playing rhythm games, but maybe this other person feels like playing a rhythm game that day. So, like, they're going to play that class as long as that's engaging and fun. It's it's g- good, right? But yeah. nobody wants to go in and create five, six, seven engaging and fun mechanics that they have to test, ensure work correctly, are balanced across different mechanic styles. That's very difficult, and so a lot of people don't do that. Now, the stratagem idea is really nice in the sense that Mm -hmm. it overarches the whole concept. It's relatively simple. You have an ability. There's a combo mechanic to make it happen. Mm -hmm. But that idea, that step forward is really, really nice. Now, obviously, Helldivers 1 kind of started this idea. True. But I would love to see that expanded more like, Anthony was talking about into other games where you mm-hmm. have these little mechanics that add a layer of interactivity and agency where you can have fun with it, essentially. I think the idea of adding uh, a degree of modularity to how you experience the game based on how you interact with those systems is something that I feel everybody can gravitate towards again you've already mentioned the development and the implementation of that kind of style is crazy like initially when i think of that for people who are reading red rising or doing anything with uh um any of those books please don't listen right now but the idea of having a game that's almost styled like senua's sacrifice and you have these aspects of the game that where you are prepping for a fight or you're in the middle of the fight. And if you do this input fast enough, you've empowered yourself for a set amount of time or I can't even propose another situation because my mind cannot think of the possibilities. It, it, they're, they're almost endless in the, the interpretation of them. But It does come down to development time, I think. I don't, and I disagree in the sense that people don't want to do it. I feel like there's a lot of people who probably have played God of War in their childhood and have become game developers now and have seen those quick time events. And it was like, no, I want to do that in like real time, though. I want people to be able to, like, hey, you make a hit after you do this input and you get a little quick cutscene and a little bit more off this guy's health because you are a fucking badass. QTE is not the way. It is not. Yeah, it's It's just not not the way forward because it doesn't add a lot of. Of agency the best the best way of do the best qte implementation i've ever seen is the reload qte that is yeah. the only one Absolutely. that's good because essentially every time you need to reload you have a short quick time event that makes it either reload faster if you press it within that little highlighted bar or, or the bullet yeah. It takes a little bit longer if you press it outside of the white bar. That is a QTE right. event. You have a limited yeah. amount of time to press your button in that spot. Obviously, it has a secondary like timing mechanic to it, but in essence, it's a QTE event. Mm-hmm. Similar to how could one argue that every Dark Souls game is actually a rhythm game? Yes. Oh, definitely. I mean, you can right? argue that every right? game is a rhythm game. Uh, you th- can say that for any game. To some degree. However, yeah. if you break down a rhythm game, it is always the same. You have to memorize a certain set of sequences, just mm. like a Guitar Hero or a DDR or something like that. Every single fight you go into in Dark Souls has a set of 
four bar measures or something like that, where you see the start of it and you have to make a decision based on when the rhythm needs to be hit, right? Sure. And those types of mechanics, right? Dark Souls, for example, like playing a rhythm game. Take that, apply that to some class. Take other game mechanics that are these basic things, like an, a really good QTE implementation like the reload and have that applied to some ranger type of class where holding and releasing at the right timing makes the arrow hit just a little bit harder those types of things those type of short putts to interesting mechanics are i i i hope the game industry kind of pulls some of those in and combining them inside of the same mm -hmm. game rather than having one game do one really interesting mechanic and then have a dozen uninteresting mechanics outside of that. You know there's going to be a foray of, sorry, there's going to be a swath of games that are going to come out that are going to be like, oh, you can, in, you can do the same thing in Helldivers. Well, let's go ahead and input some codes so that you can drop stuff down. I can, I can feel it already happening. So I do too. I it doesn't, but... For me, the best game is, uh, or for the best mechanics, come from Monster Hunter. Oh, so for D it. for DPS especially, like melee DPS, and even most of what a tank would do in a typical, you know, fantasy game, their interaction with the monster, with the bosses, should be Monster Hunter like. And they also do the rhythm thing with, I think the uh, not the bard. They don't call it the bard, but it's the hunting horn. The hunting yeah, horn, the right? Hunting they horn. have to enter stratagem-like things to do their songs. And so, right. ideally, spellcasters, or anyone casting a spell, even if you're not a spellcaster, have to do the QTE. Or not, Sorry, what am I saying? Jesus Christ. The stratagem rhythm game thing. Mm -hmm. And then, like Eric brought up, if you're maybe a warlock or a hunter, you've got some more RTS-style things, because you've got some minions or a necromancer. You're managing them. And I also think, like, if you are doing, you know, World of Warcraft, uh, what is it called? The trifecta type of thing, healer, DPS, tank. Mm -hmm. Tanks also would need to get, this is probably the most complicated one, giving a tank some real-time strategy aspects because they are directing the fight a lot of the time. You know, it's, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's a healer, sometimes it's a tank, but they need to be able to, you know, basically... Maybe instead of taunting like everything or taunting one thing at a time, maybe that aspect gets a little more complex. You know, it's not as easy as click, click button. Maybe it's different. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I think but, I, there are there are a lot of cases for being able to engage in a game that has that experience like it's it's really evocative to kind of think of a, a existence where the, the games get to that point i just don't know where that investiture of time money and skill is going Dude, to come I'm telling you, i so i texted these guys earlier this week because i started watching a really great anime he says and uh, those uh, these guys he means, we, he means us listeners by the way yes yeah I, I texted nat and eric and i said we need the star citizen equivalent for fantasy games and that was as i was watching solo leveling i was like this could happen and so it would take a long time just like star citizen you know 10 mm -hmm. 20 years mm -hmm. but Maybe someone could start up a Kickstarter and sell the right stuff in game to have, you know, the basic core things existing in a weird way mm -hmm. that it's still enjoyable and could fund it. But yeah, just add everything, you know, add dark and darker and darker mechanics that are Tarkov like, you know, add what we're talking about. Player freaking housing and and not just housing, but you know, like little outposts and mm -hmm. have lawless places and lawful places and everything in between you know if you set up your outpost here you don't have to worry about it but you pay a lot of taxes and it's and, never gonna die and stuff yeah. like that systems within systems within systems sounds yeah. awesome the like i have a app that eric introduced me with the called obsidian and one thing that i love to do in my time in between whenever i'm working or not is to watch how the web of knowledge develops whenever i press the uh generative um 
tab. So I'll watch this thing put itself together and ha- like create this web of knowledge that like everything is pretty much interconnected with something else. And it's super fascinating to watch. It makes my skin crawl sometimes, but that's what I think of whenever you approach an idea where there is this magnum opus of a game that is in existence in pretty much every, every single game developer's head that transcends the idea of a MMO. It transcends the idea of a standalone third person, first person, whatever person game that has ever been developed. You can see it in literature. I listen, I listened to the book tape of um, God. Oh, I think it's called like awaken online. I don't remember, but the game is based on a system that's very similar to what we are talking about called the ripple system. So the effects of the people in the game cause massive ripples across the entire world. So if things happen on one side of the planet, it affects everybody else in the, on on the rest of the planet. And that's a very simplified version of what, even what we are talking about, because you're, also saying that within that similar ripple system, you're you're asking for multiple layers under that of housing, um, taxes, trade, uh, banking, outlawing, hero- heroism, mavericks, being a maverick, raiding, dungeoneering, be, be, having all of these aspects and transportation. transportation. If you have ship battles, them, ship battles it the ceiling is non-existent in those in those um thought processes but the work that goes into it is so like i i don't even do any form of development and i know the work that goes into just a fraction of that is the is the life's work of most developers like they start in 2021 and they end at the point where they can't they just can't anymore they're hooked up to god knows how many machines and they're hard wired into the system and they are still making sure that whenever these people load in and they've been uh, tending to their farms the bloom looks just right so I I want this for the, for the gaming community. I think it's possible with some of the tools that we've already started uh, filling around with. I think generative AI is the perfect monster to take on the heavy load of creating these. But I also don't believe that AI is going to be the answer to generating everything for this there's going to be a healthy amount of human expression that is necessary within this creation to create human interest i feel like you can see it whenever you look at an ai image across the board and i know that there are things that have fooled others i get it there are things like technology has come over a very long way but the more we see it the more it's going to be more become synonymous is this generated by ai and the and the perception is going to be mixed from that. And I think if you're wanting to develop this kind of game and you're wanting to generate this kind of groundswell behind it, you're going to need people behind this. But you're also going to need the assistance of some serious processing and development power from an AI that is. Not, I, I don't think it's within within uh, existence right now. Not for yeah. not for gamers, at least. Well, and hopefully uh, the Star Citizen developers make Star Engine available for other developers to work with. Because, like, mm-hmm. the last uh, little con that they had where they have, like, a long, um, basically a trailer showing off Star Engine. Like, they just keep talking about Star Engine. They're not talking about the game. They're like, this is what Star, Star Engine. Engine can do. It's like, okay... The only reason you would be telling us this is if you're going to let us build on it, right? Like, why else would you do that? Because, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, they're building some really incredible tools that the game we're talking about would just use yeah. use and, and cut down the development time by like 10 years. <laughs> you know, makes sense. Well, makes sense. But I, um, makes. it's I love the idea. 
I really wish that there it was something that within our lifetime we could see the actual tools to manipulate it. I think that we need to. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't even like propose it because it's so sci fi, you know, to have like a dedicated, almost sapient AI living within a system and saying these these are the rules that I'm governing across multiple mediums. And I and they and they are not mutually ex- exclusive. Doing something in one affects everything else. Right. At least that's where my mind goes. And I know that's probably really close to like the ready player one le- level of, oh, let's just create a uh, VR existence that is pretty much life so that we can escape the one that we have now. And to those who say that, yeah, it, it totally, yeah, it totally makes sense that you would say that it, it fits the bill, <laughs> but I th- I feel like there's merit to being able to generate an actual gaming experience that brings something finally new to something that we've all been doing for pretty much our entire lives almost. Um I feel like a f- FPS is an FPS is an FPS and I would love to see a new genre come about that kind of just like says, yeah, we do everything. Yeah. But and 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 it talks to everything and it is it is a fully closed system and it is almost fully sapient of you and those around you and iterates based on your input. Yeah. The true I, iteration of yeah. what Guild Wars 2 would have aspired would have to be. Been. Yeah, because right. Guild Wars, I was going to say that, actually, whenever you were mentioning the inputs and like changing the way that a game plays based on like what you actually picked up as a, as a class. Guild Wars was ahead of its time for oh, that 100%. in terms of Guild Wars 2. Yeah. Like Guild Wars 2, every single, ga- every single class pretty much plays sep- different, not just because of the class that you select, but the weapons that you choose. Oh. Every weapon j- changes up what you can actually do so yep. fascinating stuff um anthony what have God. you been playing what have, anthony yeah what have you been playing dude well there's this new game that y'all might not have heard of called uh hell divers 2 <laughs> <laughs> he's like that's all i've been doing for you i wasn't kidding. democracy I wasn't kidding. oh my god <laughs> all of my content is hell divers currently <laughs> i have not it's the played. hottest game on the planet i mean man. it is it is very hot it is very hot Every yeah, single meme sure. that I see on TikTok is like Hell Divers themed for video no. games, and I don't see anybody else. Like honestly, no. Pal World who who at this point because I don't see anybody playing Pal World on well, in, it's, like it's, major. I, I think that's mostly just because Pal World isn't actually out. It's just like Valheim where yeah, you get into it. Oh, this is really cool. Oh, it's not done yet. Okay, I can't wait till it's done. Yeah, and then wait however many years, you know. Bye. Yeah, <laughs> so. Yeah, it's it's one of those types of games, but uh, what might interest you guys more is the thing that I've glossed over a couple of times. I finally watched solo leveling. Oh, oh my god! I Are you won, caught up? You Are you what? caught up? Yeah. Well, I've watched the first six episodes. Okay. Which is caught up for Americans. So you're caught up for Americans. Yeah. Yeah. And American I, watchers. American watchers. I, I was going to American rewatch readers. the the whole series, but I could only get through one episode. I wanted to double check things and I rewatched the first. Well, here, before I get into that, because I know mm-hmm. someone wow. might Layers. cut me off. I recently <laughs> watched a really great video by Tom Scott where he talks about dubbing and subtitling and how complex that is and why it's complex and oh, how yes, when, when you're doing certain types of uh, dubbing, which is the speaking, you're trying to match up the lip m- movements. That's not so much of a thing in anime because the lip movements are not human like yeah. this. So it's not as big of a deal. Uh, but then the other thing is timing. Like how much time do you have to convey what they're saying and and get it across? And then there's also like translating the joke into something that is of that language so that they get it. Because if you give them the exact translation, it's just not going to work, right? 
And so I rewatched the entire first episode in Japanese with subtitles on, and it was very much worse than the dub. Because in the dub, they are able to speak so much faster than they can put words on screen. They're able to convey so much more emotion, so much more information. The voice actors are actually good. Unlike what we, you know, grew up with in terms of like, oh, you okay. know, I thought you were talking about the voice actors from the Japanese. And I was well, like, the Japanese Star. voice actors are obviously great, but Star. the English voice actors are was... also surprisingly great. Right. And so there's just certain things that like cannot be conveyed to you over text and certain scenes where there's not enough time for them to convey what's happening over text. And like at one point in time, when they go into the room and there's like the three commandments, the subtitles were terrible, absolutely atrocious. When you hear the English version of it, it's like, yes, that makes perfect sense. I completely understand what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it was just, it was just weird. I, I really wanted to watch re, cause I rewatched the whole series or minus like one episode. Cause I played hell divers with you guys with my wife. Uh, <laughs> and I was going to rewatch the whole thing in English with her, or sorry, in Japanese with her, but I, I left it up to her. I was like, I, I paused it a few times, like, this scene was completely better in the English dub. And that happened three or four times, and I was just like, I was surprised, I was shocked, because I I've experienced the opposite, where, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, bad translations in the dub, bad attempts to make a joke or switch it over, or whatever. But, in this case, it was bad textual translations they were just it was it was just so different it it was jarring it was weird i'm gonna wash some rice real quick but uh eric go ahead and jump into well i think it's eric right because i already talked about it it's hell divers for me it's hell divers for anthony i'm gonna wash some rice and you keep on going so lovely audience welcome to the eric and anthony show Oh, okay. I was so confused. I was like, are we starting over? <laughs> no, no. Take two. Take two. <laughs> Literally, there's two of us now. There's two of us. Now, welcome to the, oh the, the Erantony show. I don't know oh, what the good you know, connection would be there. I, I don't know. Sorry, I slightly mentioned this because the last time Eric and I were uh, doing a duos for Tap Haven, we were enjoying i think some scotch and i learned sure. recently that most scotches apparently use hops yeah and that might be why i struggle with scotch yeah it very well could be uh funnily enough because yeah. i did not know about your maybe hops I, and there are a good number of people that are allergic to hops too that's that's a yeah. common one I do, oh, yeah. Enough. I do wonder if it's an allergy so much as I know there's supposed to be some sort of DNA thing that's like yeah. uh, your taste for sure is just like oh this is just bitter and terrible. Yeah. And I mean that would, yeah. I mean that pretty much cuts off beer, cuts off a lot yeah. of hoppy flavors. Lot. I mean there, hops is a very for anybody a that doesn't it. know it's like a plant a, a grain. Is it a grain or a weed? I think it's a. I think it's a grain. But there's a lot of Indian, like, pale ales that apparently use hops because they put hops in it in order for it to be a preservative, for it to make it across the ocean. All beers are hops. All beers use hops. So, So essentially, what happens is when you make the mash bill, you have a bunch of grains in there, and then you'll actually fill up a giant basket with hops, and you'll put the hops in at the end of the cook cycle. And then sometimes you'll even put additional hops in during the fermentation phase and things like that. But you always, every single beer has hops in. Well, I shouldn't say every single beer. I'm pretty sure that every single beer has hops. Uh, Every beer I've had has hops in it. I don't think ciders count every beer. single beer on the market today contains hops if they didn't Ginger they would actually count. be a groot i didn't know this a, a groot. groot yeah g-r-u-i-t it might be gruit but 
That is basically a beer that instead of hops uses witches brew sounding herbs like uh, I, the, the, thank you Google for uh, the Allagash Brewing Company Beer 101 decided to use the technical term of witches brew sounding herbs like bog myrtle, yarrow, heather or juniper. <laughs> but those are actually called gruits. I don't know the pronunciation of that. I've never had I a like gruit. Gru I do too. I like Groot. I like Groot. 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 Oh, if alternatively, Groot. Groot or Gruel. Or Groot. Gruel. No, Groot. Groot. G R U Y T is just an herb mixture for bittering or flavoring beer, interestingly enough. You gotta fix Nat's audio. <laughs> <laughs> I just heard the toilet flush. Uh, <laughs> embarrassment! <laughs> so now. You nothing! That, uh, now, so we just learned that beer that doesn't have hops in it is called Groot. Groot? Yeah. G R U I T. Groot. Yeah. Groot. Why? Don't know. <laughs> Why yeah. would you do Groot? Uh, I don't know. That's all I can drink. So, like yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're allergic to something like hops, a Groot would not have hops in it. And so, if you're allergic to hops, like you could have a different that. name. I feel like they should have done a different name. Yeah, I think the so the the word Groot stemmed from an area it, that is now in the Netherlands, Belgium, and northwest northwestern Germany. The word refers to the herb mixture originally used to enhance the flavor of beers before the general use of hops. The earliest reference dates to the 10th century. Essentially, during the 11th century, the Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV had a monopoly or awarded monopoly privileges to the production and sale of Grutger Digkite, which is the Groot license. Different local authorities, some somebody who's German, and we do have some German viewers, <laughs> please correct me and don't hold it against me that I know no German. Thank you. But <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so eat it then. Yeah. Oh, half food is it? That's the only one I know. <laughs> that is not how you say it. <laughs> Did I not say it right? No, I was talking to Eric. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. like, to again, again, no <laughs> German. Don't hold it against me. Alf. Alfita. 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 I'll feet I'll in feet the sand. In the sand. I'll, all feet in the sand. No, God. All feet in the sand, uh, man. You know what? We're crucified. You know what? Go for it. Go Same. for it. Go for I don't it. Care anymore. It's just like socks, man. S-O-C-K-S. Socks. It is what it is. S-O-C-K-S. Did we discuss what so, you played, Eric? We did not. I, I, I sidebarred while you were oh, gone. a very long game. <laughs> Well, not very long. He wasn't actually gone that long. Right I enough. wasn't gone that long. I was gone. It was like five so hours. So I up. have been playing <laughs> in my free time when y'all aren't on. I've been playing oh, too. Deep Rock Galactic <laughs> Survivor. Oh, I've been playing Deep Rock Galactic good? Survivor. Single player. It is only single player, unfortunately. It is similar to something like Vampire Survivors. It's very low interaction. You go around, you level up, and things go just ballistic by the end of it. I think it is possibly the most fleshed out and most interesting of those styles of games. It is different in the sense that you have this mining mechanic and these mission mechanics, and essentially you go on little dives while you're doing this. So instead of, say, Vampire Survivors, where you go into a map, you continuously level up, and things get absolutely insane, you're in there for 30 minutes, and then you maybe kill death or maybe not, whatever, doing, whatever the yeah. end boss of the level is for 30 minutes, Deep Rock Galactic says, you have, like, three minutes to complete your objectives here and get out so that you can go deeper or die. And so... Instead of this, where I play Vampire Survivors or Death Must Die, there's always this period at the beginning that is 15 to 20 minutes of 
not a lot going on. You kind of walk around, you collect stuff. Building action. It, it yeah. does the dopamine rush. It's nice. They're fun. Nothing against those games. And then at the end, you have like 10 minutes of insanity, right? Mm -hmm. Deep Rock Galactic Survivor changes all of that because when you get to the end of any of the levels, which are only like four minute experiences, the last 20 seconds is like, oh my gosh, everything's going crazy. I'm going to die. <laughs> and Like Deep Rock Collective? Yes. Yeah. It captured the feeling of Deep Rock Galactic so well in this fun, short experience of doing these solo dives and missions on your own, leveling up your weapons, leveling up your character. It's really fun. It's fully fleshed out. I don't even think it's, it's still early access, but it really doesn't play like an early access game, I will say. It's it, like almost finished. I don't know what they plan to do to finish early access, but honestly, this version of the game is fleshed out enough to have a fun 40 to 80 hour experience where mm. you can just go in and mindlessly play this game for 20 minutes and it's got this huge amount of dopamine rush and fun factor to it in a solo experience it is well worth picking up it's super fun if you like deep rock galactic in general you'll probably enjoy this one if you like death must die or vampire survivors likes games i think you this like is this. the best version of that for me because of the level of interactivity in the levels giving you a a quick ramp up to intense and then having this like wave feature where the beginning of each level is kind of relaxing, but then it ramps up to insanity really quickly, and you go wave instead of one long 30, 40 minute wave, you get little waves of like four minutes building up to intense, four minutes building up to intense, and each time you go deeper, it gets more and more intense. So you have this long wave, that's go uh, this long linear line, and then you have these short sawtooths whoa, through the levels. Whoa, yeah, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and it's... It's a lot of fun. Okay. I, I have, I've played a bunch. I think it's probably going to be one of the first videos that I release on my solo channel once I have that set up because I've done a little bit of recording for it. I recommend picking it up and trying it out. It is one of those types of games that you can pick up and just play a little bit of. Super fun. And the dopamine rush is insane. They have the, one of the coolest little features. There are, you have all the little bugs, and then it'll, you'll have a swarm, and it'll be like, careful, Miner, a swarm is approaching. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, your entire screen starts to look like it's closing in because of how many spiders are coming in from the edges and That's bugs. Right. And you're like, how am I going to survive? And you're starting to like dig through walls and like hide in corners and try to kill stuff. Inside of the swarm, there are the orange blow-up dudes mm -hmm. that you know from the original game Yeah, that will do damage to the insects. So you're like trying to get just close enough to activate them while they're still in the swarm. And when that pays off, and there's like six of them, and they all blow up, and your whole screen gets covered in gems in this giant explosion that you just barely survive by getting out like just far enough away. You finish. The dopamine rush is <laughs> insane. A hundred percent. Yeah. It, you're just done. You're a sweaty mess on the floor. It's just <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> I, just, I just imagine B showing up to, to, to showing up back to the house and Eric's just like in a puddle on the floor <laughs> dude I just realized you can tell how uh, much I've what's the word I used to be very sweaty at video games and literally and you can tell that I'm not so much anymore just by looking at my mouse and seeing that. Yeah, oh, that man. still looks new. It's really yeah. old. It doesn't have the like the markings on it, you know, where you like wear it out. Oh yeah. I, don't, I mean, I it, okay. I could be wrong. Get there. Mouse technology might just be so good that you can't do that anymore. But I, I, I'm pretty sure I just don't 
I don't sweat literally on my mouse not anymore. Like, not like well, that anymore. Wait, wait. I mean, show me y'all's mouses. Did do, do y'all's mouses look yeah. pristine, or do y'all do y'all look like worn? Yeah, yours looks normal. It, there's a little glare, but that looks. Oh, oh, oh! Nat, turn it. I've had this one oh. for uh, two years now. I think. Can't tell from Nat's. I can't see the finger buttons. This is like the best mouse that's ever been made, by the way, too. I love this mouth. Logic oh, check. Yeah, uh, go ahead and too. sponsor us whenever you're ready. We will do an entire mouse stream. I'll review all Are of the mice on your website <laughs> for a measly Matt, cost a of sponsoring us. Thank you. I'm actually, What's that? I'm actually really surprised. Nat, you have such a small mouse for such large hands. Yeah. Like, I use this one because I love how my slightly big hands not nearly as big as yours, actually get, like, cupped by it. It's more comfy. Listeners, watchers, let me explain something to you. I do not work in the same financial bracket as these, as these motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> so when I built my PC, I was not able to get the, the bells and whistles necessary to get a, a, mouse, a mouse that fit my hand. So... We are at this level for now until Bro, things change, which is fine. On the other hand, on the other hand, I got to bring up something that I loved that a uh, hippo said once or not hippo. This might have been Burks Burks mm -hmm. from he's a star citizen content creator. He brought up that spending, I don't know, like a few hundred dollars a month on gaming versus a few hundred dollars a month on going to the bar is something that anybody can do and yeah. he's like so some people spend that same amount of money in gaming and they get that so like for you like you've got some what really are nice you guitars, trying man. to say you got some really nice Anthony. guitars man that's what i'm saying i'm saying that i'm saying Anthony, i don't think it's necessarily the i don't bracket. have i don't have i think six it's to eight guitars that constitute the years that you have known me in the time that I've been gaming. I have oh, never I'm been a bar. Finish. No, let me I'm finish. Saying, I have been a teacher <laughs> for eight years before I came into this role now. So before you say, oh, it's just some simple uh, budget flexing. <laughs> there was a period of time in my existence when my paycheck literally was my existence. I, I got it. It went away. And that was it. No, but, no, but no, people, you were no. Were you a teacher, Anthony? No, nah, I mean, some people, Anthony, some, Anthony, some, were you a teacher? I was a tutor. Was that your main income? So income? Yes, as an adult, I would have liked to think I was an adult at the time. Anthony, answer the question <laughs> it's a yes or no. That was my only source of income when Anthony, I was a child. Anthony, answer the question. As an adult, where did you educate? No. no. So shut <laughs> your <laughs> face. But like... Kindly. Some people, you know, choose to I be love more you. lonely and play games versus get married. Absolutely. I mean, that's Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Do you know what they do? for fun do they go to do any form of personal training do they do any form of self-care do they cook their own meals no. no no they wallow and they cry and they play games to stop crying so, anthony are you telling me that i should have been more sad no no no, more no, no, depressive no, 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 no. during the I'm times saying, when I'm i was saying, cause you're giving me mixed signals here buddy i'm saying it's an option and some people take that option <laughs> buddy <laughs> You conveyed this message very poorly for me. I'm just messing around. <laughs> <laughs> I have these things because they make me happy. And I have, I have no guilt towards uh, spending money on, on those things. I know that I have a lot of nice things uh, outside of just my gaming PC. That being said, I did not have upwards. To the, I don't think anybody had upwards to the amount, the amount of money necessary to buy a 30 series card at the time that I was building my PC. Nobody just had $3,000 $3, just sitting off to the side to buy one off of eBay that had been already used at that point. In time. Well, sorry, no, not even used, just scalped pretty much at that point. In you time. Were, so, not even that. You were lucky to get one because you were building your <laughs> exactly. PC 
when they had all of the shortages and mm-hmm. nobody was getting a 30 series, let alone except for your sister. No, that was after the shortage. Yeah, oh, that was after the yeah, shortage. Yeah, she she built she built last year. Her PC makes me weep. Because <laughs> I also at this same period tried to get one. And I had to buy yeah. a laptop and get an She's old got- generation GPU to Jesus. even have a good computer then, let alone uh I couldn't we, believe we, my computer broke down at the height of discu- that. We've discussed my my sister's computer and how the 3080 ti in there that runs the sims is just weeping <laughs> at its misuse we specifically discussed how you could potentially swap out swapped your own gpu i could have just swapped not, it. You oh my God. it i would never notice <laughs> she would honestly for the sim back- i feel like some of the stuff is a little heavy back then she would notice but now that she's not looking at it every day. Does it have a glass? Oh, yeah. It Does it have a glass case? case? It, it, is it's it a on Lian the floor? Lee. It's is a it on the floor? Lee. Or is it like on the floor? No. Oh, she would see it. Yeah, no, I, I told her, like, you, you're not going to put this thing on your carpet. Like, you're yeah. not gonna, I'm not going to I'm not going to have a call come from you saying, like, my computer won't turn on anymore. And me the- come over and find out that you've burned out yeah. your, your entire PC. Like, I'm not doing that. Well, so this is Nikki, right? Yeah, this is Nikki. Yeah. Oh man. So I I I built that PC with the intensive purpose to be like, look, I'm going to do this one nice thing for you, and that and I I do it because I love you, but also understand that what I'm building for you is in I, no way appropriate for what you're actually planning to do for it. Like, I wanted to make this as future proof for you as possible. You said that your budget was. X, so I built within your budget. Your budget Dude. is obscene. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly don't know if you, if you want a future proof of a thing. I think a eighty Ti is always great because I still have a nine eighty Ti running in the desktop that my wife uses, and mm-hmm. she doesn't have a problem with it. She plays every game I play at fourteen forty p ultra wide, mm-hmm. and. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many years it's been, but that's the I reason why a long time. Any, any, anything operating at an 80 or an 80 Ti basis is going to come with an 80 or 80 Ti price point. That's there's yeah. a reason why 3060s and 3070s also all, are always under a grand. Yeah. But as soon as you tread into 80s territory, you are saying, I want to build a PC that is going to one last me and two has the horsepower to keep up with whatever it is that I throw yeah. at it. Not, so, not one of those. Oh, I'm going to upgrade it. No, every couple no. Of years. Like, once you no, get it, it you're done. That you're is done. a masterpiece. You're done. You're done. <laughs> Honestly, There's now nothing it, that you can do. You're done. Yeah. Nowadays for gaming, you just don't need the horsepower that you did back in the day comparatively to what the standard market was. Like the the standard market will cover most, if not all, games at a good enough uh, resolution and frame rate. The reason you would need a nice card now, the only reason you would be in the small niche that needs to upgrade their cards very often, is if you're working in the 3D tech space and you're doing Mm -hmm. rendering or things like that that require. Stronger GPUs, not because your GPU can't do it, but because your time is worth more than the cost of the GPU. Where rendering it in 10 seconds versus 10 minutes means something to you. Mm -hmm. And that's where you start replacing a GPU every year and a half or so. But if you're not part of that, if you're just gaming, like that 980 Ti will probably last you another five years. In the gaming space, honestly, you're, you're, yeah. it's getting to the point where like that could be replaced by by something. Dude, like what's funny? Yeah, this something. this 980 Ti, I got the same one I think that Eric had when we were roommates. Yep, and it can be water cooled. I never water cooled it, so it's just doing the air thing. But for the longest time, like three or four, maybe even five years now, it's had like a temperature sensor that's wrong, so it goes. It was constantly ramping up the fan up and down. It annoys me 
so much. If my wife isn't in here gaming, that is off. <laughs> like, I, I do not enjoy that wine. Oof. Luckily, when we're gaming, I don't notice it, you know, if but you like headphones on. Yeah, but when I'm like sitting here working, oof, I'm like, how are you not no dead game. yet? Why are you still trucking along? <laughs> Uh, you can't help. You can't help it. It wants to live, man. It wants to live. Well, if the fan dies, just water cool it. Last another ten. Uh, that's funny. Well, speaking of dying graphics cards, audience, I, I think we can kind of bid adieu here to our longest episode yet. <laughs> I thought you were about to be the, 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 the podcast that, or the episode that needs to die. <laughs> or the, the, pod, the episode that never dies. I'll be real. I don't know how many people will make it past the, the <laughs> hour long rant in this one. If you do, we love you. Appreciate you could cut it. that out and save it for a Patreon super <laughs> secret uh, extra high tier. I, Future thing. I we could do that because otherwise I don't know. It if might have been gonna really <laughs> dull. <laughs> yeah, it might. I don't know if it'll make it into the final edit. At the very least, I know there'll be a short in it because I think it'll be a funny short somehow. Because I know it's going to start with, in my opinion. <laughs> but audience, we love you, and go check out. Uh, youtube.com slash at Borderman for some fun gaming stuff, which I know he's putting up a bunch of shorts. He's over here on yep. my screen. That's going to be this way. He's putting up a bunch of shorts and he's got a, some cool new content coming your way. And a lot of our Tap Haven Plays stuff will probably live on there in short content form, at least for the time being. I'll have a channel up running soon enough and have some fun stuff on there as well, as will the guy down there once he's finished his career shifting. But with that, y'all have a good week, and we'll catch you next time. Peace. Ah!